I'm Chris Richardson, and this is not a pipe podcast. Today, I'm very happy to be speaking with Deborah Elizabeth Whaley about her book, Black Women in Sequence, Re-Inking Comics, Graphic Novels, and Anime. So thank you, Deborah, for talking to me. I've been anticipating this conversation since I read your book earlier this year. Maybe we can just start with you entering a realm that is traditionally at least seen as a very white, very masculine area, which is comics. And as you say in the opening of your book, I am a black woman in a fanboy world. What kept you coming back to this world and um, how have you been able to etch out a space for yourself and others who, who are not necessarily white men? So there were really three entry points for me into this project. And one was certainly as a scholar. The other was as an artist. The only training that I've done in art is in cartooning. I do other types of of art, but I have some training in that area. And also as a reader, as, as a fan, as someone who sees comics, graphic novels, anime, sequential art in general as a platform to think about race and gender, social relations, history. I find sequential art to also be a site of of pleasure as well. And so in terms of opening up the space for others who are perhaps not associated with who we see oftentimes as the target market for comics, which as you said, and as I say in my book is is oftentimes um, men first and then second white men, and then maybe even third, mid, white men of a certain age, right? Mm-hmm. And so writing this book was a way to open things up, to have an opportunity to to educate or to have people think about comics in terms of difference and all of the stakes that are involved in representation, production, artistry, readership, all of those things. And so there's the writing, but I've also spent a lot of time talking to readers, doing podcasts on comic. For a while, I was a regular on the Black Comics chat. Mm-hmm. We would do like, a, you know, one podcast a month. And so that acted as a way to not only let potential readers like know about the work I was doing. And so by the time my book came out, there was, you know, people who were already anticipating it. And it ended up really being something that that readers and fans found useful and were excited about. So talking to readers, talking to fans, being a part of a podcast, talking to other creators, you know, just providing opportunities, whether it's going to a regional Comic Con or whether it's going to a library to, again, talk to people about the representation of African American, Black women, multicultural women, and even just difference more broadly in comics in ways that perhaps they might not have, you know, read it in the particular way in which I'm analyzing it. And it can sort of open up new avenues of interest uh, and new avenues of investigation. And how did you start to collect ideas and examples as you were working on this book? Because Obviously, you use a number of different examples, both of women of color being represented in comics, but then also behind the comics, writing them or or in the production process. How did you go about looking for these things? Was it a sort of organic process or was there a way that you found worked best as you were perhaps looking at archives? What did you do to, to begin collecting your data? Well, it was organic insofar as when I started the project, I didn't say like, this is where I'm going to start and I'm going to go to this archive. I just sort of, as I went, went deeper and deeper and deeper into the literature, into examples, into my research. And so the the really early genesis of this project was based on an article that I was going to do on the character Catwoman. And I was interested in issues of race, but more broadly, I wanted to think about gender, sexuality, and ethnicity, and how the characters' race and ethnicity had shifted over time. So this is where it started. And as I started writing the article and looking for research, 
on Black women and comics scholarly research and other types of popular sources, the internet uh, as well, you know, going to chat rooms like the DC chat rooms or message boards where readers and fans were talking about this particular character that is Catwoman. And so it, it started there. And as my research began, I found that there really wasn't a lot written about race and ethnicity and blackness and women in comics. And so this one article that I was trying to write made it really clear to me that this could be a much bigger project. But I didn't go into it saying, I'm going to write a book on black women in comics. Mm-hmm. And so as I continued to do my research, I, I began to see like where the holes were in scholarship, where things were going in terms of the various trends, different forms of sequential art that uh, fans and readers are really gravitating towards, like anime and manga. And so it just continued to grow. And by the time I had written the Catwoman article, and then I start to write um, what I also kind of thought was going to be an article, too, on Jackie Orms. Mm -hmm. As I was working on the Jackie Orms article and trying to figure out what I could say that other people who have written about her have not said, there's a great book by Nancy Goldstein on, on Jackie Orms. It's a very beautiful visual book with some context. And there's a, a, a wonderful article uh, that has been written on a particular comic that the Black female comic cartoonist um, Jackie Orms created called Torchy Brown. And so I was thinking, okay, well, what can I do that Edward Brunner didn't do, that Nancy Goldstein didn't do. And so that's when my training as a cultural historian and as an artist came up. And so it became clear to me that I could really only do this project by drawing on all of my own strengths, my my background in uh, cartooning and the training that I've had, again, um, as a fan, as a reader, but yes, also as a scholar too, as a historian as someone who does work on popular culture and visual culture and who is invested in having people think about the representation in this form, again, in a sort of scholarly educational way, but also just talking about the pleasures of having the opportunity to see representations that are either similar to who you are or that are different and therefore opens up a new cultural avenue uh, for those who see themselves or, or who, who don't identify as Black women, which is, you know, that's the, the, the main focus of the book is on um, Black women as creators and artists and authors, and then particular Black characters that have been popular over time, but also thinking about some characters that possibly people don't know that are not popular and having the opportunity to sort of highlight those creators and titles as a way, again, to sort of open things up and provide the opportunity to bring in more readership and more interest into the representation and the production of Black women in sequential art. There's so much to talk about in relation to representation, but I thought maybe let's focus in on Catwoman for a second, because I hadn't really thought about this before, even though I'm a pretty big Batman fan and I had read a lot of the comics that you refer to. Mm -hmm. But if you ask somebody if Catwoman is black, a lot of people say, no, of course not. But then other people might say, yes, of course, look at this example or this example. The interesting thing there that I think you really highlight is that this character has its own sequence in which some strands are racialized, some are not racialized, some are more sexualized, some are more vilified in terms of when she's like doing crime as opposed to working with Batman as a good person or whatever, a good character. These characters, though, especially Catwoman, is so amorphous that she may or may not be black, she may or may not be good, and depending on which version you're speaking about, that can significantly change how you think about her. So how do you how do you negotiate that kind of thing when you're dealing with a character who's not clearly anything really because there's so many iterations? Well, one of the things I tried to do is to talk about the possibilities of that racial ethnic shift that has gone on over time and to think about within any given historical moment what it might mean to have a character 
who is raced uh, as black or as ambiguously black. So I talk about Catwoman in terms of the televisual or the television uh, iteration, right? The the Batman television show, mm-hmm. which uh, had Eartha Kitt as Catwoman for a short time. Of course, Julie Newmar and Lee Merriweather uh, were Catwomans before uh, Eartha Kitt was. And, and on the Batman television show, like, no character ever said, like, you are the black cat woman. So it was really interesting that she was both marked racially and not marked. Again, what I try to do is to talk about how sometimes racial ambiguity can open things up and be interesting. And sometimes racial ambiguity cannot connect with characters. So when Eartha Kitt did Catwoman in the 1960s, it was this huge cultural shift. When Halle Berry does Catwoman in 2004 as, uh, you know, as an ambiguous, racialized, ethnic character, it doesn't work. And it doesn't seem as uh, progressive or, or useful. And so we have this character that was originally written based upon a, a, what, what many would consider sort of a stereotype, um, which is a sort of dragon lady representation image stereotype that gets attributed to Chinese and Chinese American women. And so that's the sort of archetype, character archetype that the character was based off of. But yes, was uh, written in the comic originally as a white character. There has been some play over time, more contemporarily, where she becomes a bit ethnicized and it shifts in different ways. And so there's been discussion about is Catwoman, and I'm talking about the comic books now, in particular in the graphic novels. Mm-hmm. Is she Italian? Is she Irish? Is she half this? Is she half that? There has also been some comics that has Catwoman very conspicuously raced as Black or African American as, as well. So, you know, I, I just find her a really fascinating character to be able to think about how through different modalities, television, film, graphic novel, more popular comic book, and all these different forms and modalities. What are the opportunities to think about visual representation? One of the things I try to do in this book, representation is important. Representation can be political. Thinking about how you can create characters who are not stereotypical is a wonderful thing, and and readers can really find that useful. But I didn't want to sort of stick in this sort of like good representation, bad representation, or stereotypes, or not stereotypes, or progressive here, but stereotypical there. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to do something a lot more uh, nuanced and thoughtful. And that would mean thinking not just about representation, but about the writing, about aesthetic choices in the art, about readership, about the producers, their history, why they decided to write characters in particular ways. And so what I really wanted to do was a a sort of broad, all-encompassing project, just because there has not been, as far as I know, any monograph about Black women in comics. So I had a lot of ground I had to cover uh, in a, a you know a decent amount of pages, but but still relatively small. And uh, yes, Catwoman was a, a great starting point to begin to think about all these important questions. Actually, the only other thing I was going to ask you about with Catwoman uh, before have you have you seen the new stuff with Batman and Catwoman getting married at all? I haven't, but that has happened before where they were married in a, a parallel universe. Hmm. Uh, and so I, I haven't really read Catwoman, I would say like, gosh, the last several, uh, like, like four or five years. Yeah. Well, and the only reason I ask is that, uh, they, I thought they did an interesting thing in that. So the, um, the story doesn't even matter so much for, for our purposes, but they become fiancés, and Batman, I believe, proposes to her. But the the interesting thing that I was going to ask about, that I'm sure you can still answer to a degree, is that they have this conversation a few times during the whole arc, the story arc of them getting married, and he insists that he met her, I forget exactly how it goes, but um, for example, he says he saw her on a rooftop, she says no, it was on the street corner, and what they're doing is they're referring to two different origin stories that have been happening in the comics, and so if you follow, I believe it's Frank Miller's, mm-hmm. they meet in an alleyway before he's really 
Batman as we know him. But if you look at some of the other things, like the early uh, comics, then he foils her uh, robbery or something like that. So right. like, there's multiple origin stories, and they play with that as like, where did we actually meet? We met here? No, we met there. That kind of thinking, just in general, I find interesting because comics seem to do that more than any other medium that I'm aware of. You can have, you know, four different origin stories. None of them are necessarily true or false. I think there's a temptation, really, and I'm sure that a lot of the the message boards and stuff talk about the real one or the best one. But in in the sense of iterations and for a character like Catwoman, how do you stay away from, I guess, the notion that this is the real Catwoman and she is black or she is not black, while also not being so relativistic that you know anyone is Catwoman and any any iteration is equally good or bad or or however you want to discuss the representation? Do you come up with an idea of the canon or of what you're going to say, yes, this is a Catwoman representation and no, this is simply fan art or this is an imaginary universe that doesn't count for the canon? Or, or how, do you, how do you negotiate these competing sort of narratives? Well, I made the decisions based upon patterns, based upon which um, iterations I found to be the most compelling. So before I was saying I haven't read Catwoman in a long time, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that I really liked Ed Brubaker's version of Catwoman. I'm talking about Catwoman, mm-hmm. the graphic novel right now. Mindy Newell also did a really uh, a compelling narrative of Catwoman 2 that I felt was, you know, it, it was worthy to sort of pick up and, and look at. So I was making these decisions based upon the types of writing and artistry and narratives that I thought were monumental. And so, again, just trying to chart the changes over time from the very beginning, uh, you know, going into, you know, Frank Miller as well in the 1980s. And so, yes, Catwoman has lots of different origin stories. And I think part of that has to do with keeping things interesting, keeping readers interested And using these sort of um, origin resets or parallel universes as a way to make the comic, the narrative, the visual representation anew. It gives you these opportunities to go in different directions. And then you can say at a later moment, okay, we're going to go back to this origin of the character, like play homage to that moment, or we're going to take it into an entirely new iteration that's still, you know, Catwoman, but um, perhaps adding another layer of, uh, of interest psychologically, visually, um, in terms of narrative as well. And so, yes, that's, that's how I made the decisions, just sort of being a reader, a fan, and deciding for myself as, you know, there, obviously research went into this as well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what moments within the Catwoman story are monumental? And I didn't just do that with the Catwoman character. I did it with all of the characters that I write about. So I, you know, I may not write about every visual artist and author's version of a character. You know, I guess I should also say that this project wasn't thesis driven in so far as I didn't say, okay, I'm going to write this book. And this is exactly what I'm trying to argue. I had an argument, but I, I wanted to leave some room for discovery. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started the book or, you know, when I first started writing about Catwoman, I had an argument in so far as I wanted to think about the character over time and her cultural use. But it was really only through the research and talking to readers and fans and and having the the opportunity to even talk to some of the producers that I really began to hone my argument more and see more and find other avenues of investigation that I could take that would make this project worthwhile for for readers and for myself. As you said, there hasn't been very much at all on black women in comics as a scholarly study. Did that make things harder or easier for you? I mean, I'm sure there are sort of pros and cons to approaching something that hasn't been very well documented, although I guess uh, the newspaper archives and comics archives may have stuff, but there's not a whole lot of scholarship on that. Was it a good thing for you or a bad thing for you in terms of being one of the first to write a a uh, large study on this topic? 
it was a welcomed challenge. <laughs> you know, it wasn't so much that it was difficult, although there were difficult and challenging moments when writing a particular chapter or talking about a, a specific moment in a in a producer's you know in a producer of of a very various comic strips or or graphic novels or or comic books and um some of the situations i got into and so far as there not being enough information and having to be somewhat speculative um or in some cases there was a, a good deal maybe written about a title but the black female character in this title really was not explored. And so just sort of thinking about then how do I write about, how do I point to the urgency or the meaning or the importance of a particular character who many might just read as a sidekick, right? Or as one person in a collective sometimes. And I'm thinking of characters like um, Vixen, mm -hmm. right? And in Justice League of America, in Animal Man, in Suicide Squad. Of course, eventually she did get her own um, title uh, for a while. But uh, I could say mostly for me, the challenge was welcomed and it made things exciting. But there absolutely were moments that became frustrating where you want to talk about a particular character, but there just really isn't enough to justify a chapter you know, just sort of worrying about coverage and, and, you know, what characters is it really important for me to address in a more meaningful way? And then what characters do I just want to let people know about? You know, that opens up avenues for people to come after me uh, to do the work that I wasn't able to do. I guess I should also say, I, you know, I really liked your, your point and your question about was this difficult because it had never been done? Um, and was there sort of a weight on me saying, okay, this is going to be the first book. Luckily, I was never thinking about that. I, I never felt the pressure of this is going to be the first book to do this. So it's going to create writer's block or, you know, I just feel all of this um, pressure. I wanted to do a good job and have it be thoughtful, but it, it wasn't anything that was anxious written for me. If If anything, sort of what I was thinking about was, okay, well, my first book did pretty well. Um, am I a one-hit wonder? <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess in terms of, um, you know, being concerned about the book, I, I kept thinking, you know, well, the second book has to be better than the first book. And so there was, you know, some worry there, but I got over it yeah. <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Well, I mean, to some extent, this book is uh, sort of a celebration of the people who have either been represented or been doing the representing and stuff like that. And so you're using a lot of interesting examples, many of which I, I wasn't aware of, and now I am. And so I think a lot of people might have that experience. How much of your work would you say in this book is about looking back and reimagining the history of Black women in sequence and saying, you know, you might not have realized it, but this is an important uh, author or artist, and this is an important character that may have, may have been overlooked and, and these kinds of things. So basically going back and saying, no, no, uh, black women have been present in comics, despite maybe not being uh, as well known as some of the bigger superheroes or what have you. How much of it is going back and, and showing that history? And then how much of it is coming up with arguments about rethinking things that people might know, for example? It's really both of those things, and that's why in the book I talk about re-inking and, and, as you said, rethinking what we think we know. So most obviously the book is about Black women and sequential art. But what I also tried to do was to think about and to theorize and to engage with the ways in which these moments in representation can be seen as going along with the particular historical moment or cultural shift going on in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a big part of this book for me was I'm not just writing about, you know, Eartha Kitt as Catwoman, I'm also writing about, like, what did it mean for her to do this project in the 1960s, like given civil rights? Or even with my discussion of uh, the woman who is noted as the first Black female cartoonist Jackie Orms, what did it mean for this woman to be doing this art in the 1930s in Black newspapers as someone who ended up being surveilled by the FBI 
all of these pressures, but yet she's creating these really interesting, funny, witty, sometimes political and progressive, if you want to use those words. And so she was using her comics, her um, one panel comics, as well as her comic strips to talk about what was going on in that moment in the 1930s with Black people, with the Black community, with the nation as, as a whole. You know, she, Jackie Orms uses the character Candy to talk about World War II and, you know, the ways in which we can think about Black people's uh, role in American patriotism as patriots or as those who are shut out because of class in the 1940s. And so for me, Black Women in Sequence is definitely looking back at the history, the history of Black women, the history of Black people, uh, cultural history just in general, when and where do Black women enter into that historical narrative. But yes, you know, also thinking about contemporarily, what have those historical figures, characters, authors, inkers, writers, you know, what did they do back then that's still important for us to think about today as well as in the future? And when you start to think about representation, I'm curious whether you find that Black women in particular have a set of concerns or a set of um, concepts in terms of their representation that are significantly different from other arguably equally marginalized groups, for example, Hispanic characters, Asian characters. Uh, you talk about some of the some of the other books that have done work on these subjects and collected mm -hmm. collected earlier examples and talked and theorized these things. So these can be, I'm sure, they can be helpful. Did you find that in some cases, books that had been written about, say, Asian Americans in comics or Hispanic characters in comics or in popular culture were there places where you said where you thought to yourself perhaps that that works for them but in when it comes to representation of black women there's a problem or there's something different going on sure that's a really great question but i want to quickly preface before my answer there still needs to be a lot of work on women of color in comics and so um, even mm -hmm. though you know there are some who have written articles and anthologies um, and in, in some cases, monographs about the Asian American representation in comics or the Latino or Latin American or Chicano representation in comics, there's still um, gender trouble and um, some underrepresentations of gender insofar as women are concerned. So I wanted to say that there's still so much more work to be done. But in terms of Black women, I think that in communities of color, largely, there are issues in regards to class and the ways in which communities of color differentiate themselves, sometimes based on class, sometimes based on color gradation, even though, again, you see that in other communities of color. I think with Black people, with people of African descent, um, this issue of, of colorism and class conflict. I have a lot of information about that, you know, as a, as a historian, you know, I'm an Americanist. I do American cultural history and comparative ethnic studies more broadly, but I'm also an African-Americanist too. So in terms of things that are different and talking about Black women in particular, I, I would say yes, talking about color and class and sexuality. And now you can talk about those things with any racial ethnic character, but there are ways in which women of African descent experience, experiences these things in different ways, right, than other women in general, just because of the historical legacy of slavery, of Jim Crow, mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of these sort of policies of uh, the nation state, of the, the way in which in culture, um, you know, people of African descent, Black people are viewed in oftentimes really menacing ways. And so if you're going to write a project that is about Black women, even though it's about imagined Black women, for me, I still had to, you know, sort of really think about, okay, well, what does the representation or the narratives or the experiences of particularly Black women in comics, what, what does that mean? And so I, I hope to have really been able to paint that picture for readers and maybe perhaps most successfully in the Jackie Orms chapter, 
which is the first chapter. And then in the third chapter where I look at Vixen and um, Storm and Nubia, uh, who were not written uh, Mm -hmm. by uh, people who identify as uh, people of African descent. So, So that was really interesting to sort of think about what that means. And I guess, well, another interesting aspect I thought about when you think about fictional women who are both sort of representing their contemporary situation that is happening in the world, but is also happening on the page through cartooning or through other forms of representation. I mean, you talk about um, Orms's work as happening during the Depression, and you say that uh, the narrative could serve as the psychological equipment of resilience and tenacity against economic odds. In that sense, it's in, it can be inspiring to see this character. In others, I think some are more, and not necessarily in the ones that you've covered, but some characters can be more confrontational about uh, trying to achieve, by whatever means in the story, a better, more more equal world. Sometimes these characters act as, as resilient. Sometimes they act as models for the future. Sometimes, uh, obviously, these fictional characters, they can virtually do anything. When you are approaching them, do you read the character a few times, let's say, and then think that this is an example of resilience, whereas this is an example of critique? Or uh, like once you once you understand who the character is by, say, reading a few issues or what have you, do you then think of these characters in these ways or are they always changing or do you put them into sort of categories once you begin to understand how they function in, in their fictional world? I try to stay away from categories or container archetypes, although as you read and look at the image of Black women, the narratives of Black women in sequential art, you begin to see patterns, right? Mm -hmm. I never read a title and said, this is just wholly stereotypical, or this is just so progressive. Again, I was really thinking about nuance. I was thinking about the historical moment in which it was created. And I was thinking about it as a a cultural critic and cultural historian who is interested in issues of social justice, who is interested in reading um, people who have at times been marginal to the narrative, being um, re-centered, but also leaving some room for for ambiguity, for um, a discussion about characters who, you know, again, may serve no sort of um, progressive agenda in any way, but could be doing other types of cultural work. And one of, one of the things I really like about Jackie Orms's work is at the end of the day, it was always funny, hmm. you know, and, and there's a way in which it, that it could have been really preachy or obvious. And it wasn't. And I think that was just the beauty of her writing. And again, it's, it's comic strips or gags. So she has one or two sentences, or if it's a comic strip, you know, she has like four or five sentences to make a point. You know, with the narrative and with the visuality and making it, it entertaining, but also making it something that people would sort of think about afterwards that would create these sort of aha moments where maybe they're beginning to think about things in a different way just because Orms through humor or just other creators of, as well have um, been able to sort of strike this balance of writing about, you know, narrating and visualizing characters that could be based on real people, or again, could be based upon people that they would imagine, you know, to be useful for for readers to think about. But I think the great thing about sometimes popular culture more generally, but sequential art and comic book more specifically, is that, you know, while there are differences across the board, The best comics strike that balance of engaging the reader, um, being humorous, being interesting, but also making you think about things, too, about thinking about things that are going on in the world or perhaps thinking about things, uh, people, characters in different ways. No, and I completely agree that that having a character tell you exactly how it should be interpreted is never a a good idea compared to having a character that makes people converse about certain topics in the world. I'm thinking actually about a a number of conversations I had after uh, the success of Wonder Woman, the Mm -hmm. film came out. The two, the two main sides, I guess, to, to really simplify, I would say, uh, some people thought that this is great. You're showing a really strong woman and in a male dominated field. And so this is a wonderful representation for young girls, especially. On the other side, the criticism was that you're showing basically an, a virtually invulnerable woman 
taking away all the things that women actually have to deal with today, including inequality in a number of forms and a number of ways, depending on what country you're talking about, especially. And so to just pretend that none of this vulnerability and none of these inequalities exist and that uh, women should just be, you know, strong and virtually um, invulnerable and powerful is to miss all of the important things that we should be talking about. Again, this is a super simplified version. But I'm wondering if you feel a certain way about how strong comics, especially comics that want to empower black women in particular, of these two sort of extremes, where do you see the the best work being done or where would you like to see the best work being done? One showing, I guess, the potential for excellence, another showing the sort of everyday problems that exist and, and dealing with those more negative factors. Well, I see it happening across the board one of the another thing i tried to stay away from is saying that in independent comics you get this sort of um really edgy type of um art and and narrative but in titles that are more popular it's just not as interesting artistically but to really think about in both realms what the possibilities are and you know what things were authors and artists and inkers doing even in popular titles where they weren't even conspicuously talking about something specific going on in terms of social justice, but other things going on in the title that we might see as useful. So maybe it's not necessarily race, maybe it's gender, maybe it's sexuality, maybe it's class, maybe it's just about the politics of pleasure and enjoyment. You know, you mentioned the character Wonder Woman. Um, That's a great example. And, you know, she was written as a patriot. So that's always going, well, it doesn't always have to be a part of the narrative, but that's sort of where things started. You know, you can do, you can have several readings of the same cultural object. So, you know, what's uh, lesser contextualized and not as useful for one person could um, be very useful to another if you're looking in the right places, or if you're trying to look at it from different vantage points and look at those nuances and ways in which you can sort of think about characters in ways that either creates a shift or adds to the conversation. And I think Black Panther did it extremely well at um, mm-hmm. balancing. I'm talking about Black Panther, the film, the most recent film, mm-hmm. um, to be particular. Yeah. Um, but, but there's there have been you know you know Roxanne Gay and, and and some of the Ta-Nehisi Coates more recent stuff too. Um, that was quite useful as well. But, uh, you know, if you put the two together, Wonder Woman, Black Panther, as far as I'm concerned, both are great, amazing films. But I was really pleased and surprised that Black Panther, the film, really seemed to get it right on so many different levels. But there's still people who saw that and came back and said, oh, well, you know, are we still caught in this sort of like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X dichotomy, right? Either you're Mm -hmm, this revolutionary or you're somewhat of an accommodationist. And at least from my vantage point, I think Black Panther did did a lot more than in some of, you know, the writings post-film that I saw that were highly critical. I, I do think there are things to be critical about. Um, but I really do think it did a great job. And so in my last chapter, you know, chapter five, where I am talking about um, women who, at least at that time that I was researching, um, were not seen as necessarily popular writers. They were writing in the um, independent realm, that there was lots of room to do, um, to do th- So the great thing, I think, about when you're just starting out and you're not doing a popular title is you can really take it anywhere you want. But if you're coming in as a writer, an artist, and you're just doing another version of Captain America or Wonder Woman or Storm or whoever, um, you know, you're talking about the ways in which the the comics shifted and characters shifted and they get reset, et cetera. But there still is an origin, even if there are multiple origins. But if you're in the independent realm and you're interested in creating characters that are half human, half animal, that are futuristic, that have no popular origin or mass readership, so you can be very experimental. I still think some experimentation goes on in the popular realm um, as well. Um, But uh, I really thought, you know, my last chapter, chapter five – 
sort of represented what's going on in comics today in terms of interest uh, amongst readers and and viewers. And, um, you know, I talk about women such as Afua Richardson and Nara Walker and Liesl Adams and even going back to um, Barbara Brandon, um, you know, all of these women doing incredible work um, initially in the independent realm. And, um, and so they, you know, they were able to create characters, black female characters, or even some characters that are not raced, or even some characters that are uh, marked as white, um, just using the vantage point of their history, their knowledge, their interests, their concerns, and bringing that into the artistry to think the realm of comics anew. And nearly every single person doing comics today, black women in particular, all the women I interviewed said that manga and anime, you know, just about Mm -hmm. every interview I did said was really um, influenced them a great deal which I found very interesting. So then I was like, okay, well, what do I do with that? (laughs) You know, so yeah. How how does that help us rethink racial ethnic boundaries and what comes into the creation of a character and how can it be connected to other circuits of culture going on um, nationally and internationally? I want to, okay. I want to ask you about that, but first I want to ask you uh, if maybe you could say a little bit more about what you think Black Panther got right. Because you said they got a lot right. I'm sure. curious uh, if you could give an example or two. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, perhaps most conspicuously or the, the common thing that is said is that Black Panther did a great representation, um, a great narrative of having Black women being imagined within this world, not as sidekicks or or as marginal, but as producers of knowledge, of of culture, as activists, as um as as characters that, that mattered and had um a lot of sustenance to them. And mm-hmm. uh so I think the film did a, a wonderful job at that. Other things that I, um, you know, I thought that the film did particularly well. Um, I thought the writing was very strong visually. Uh, it was beautiful. How they represented this world of Wakanda um, was mm-hmm. was amazing. And then just the ways in which the film was able to pull in issues that might concern people of African descent, but at the same time, were broader that various audiences could have the opportunity uh, to think about blackness anew in visual culture. And so, you know, it really did for me narratively, visually do a lot of important work with racial representation, with gender, uh, with, with the artistry and with trying to, I don't think the film conspicuously tried to um, direct itself at multiple audiences, you know, in terms of gender, race, and class and ethnicity and all of that. Mm-hmm. But in the after effect, it, it ended up being this phenomenon, you know, and most obviously they wanted to make money and a profit, right? Yeah. So there, there are some things that you have to have in there that's congruent with this sort of comic book, you know, graphic novel, popular history type of ways of telling things but at least for me it didn't pander and i could see other people disagreeing with me quite a bit but no it didn't seem artificial i think i know what you mean yeah like they weren't they weren't clearly putting characters in to placate various audiences right and they chose the right actors i you know Mm -hmm. i've had a lot of conversations with people about okay you know would a film like black panther ever get nominated for an oscar right is the fact that it's an action adventure and a a film based on comics Will that, you know, stop um, like the Academy from thinking about the artistry and the acting? And I think, uh, unfortunately, like that is the case. But I like to remind people that the acting in Black Panther was phenomenal. The casting was 
phenomenal. I don't think we should lose sight of that either. The the directing, you know, was I'm, I, you know I was already a, a fan of Ryan Coogler, but um, you know they, they they got a lot of things right with casting and directing as well as the cinematography and and other things as well. So. I actually wouldn't be surprised if it gets some Oscar nominations because I think they're also, I, I mean, so. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think the Oscars are trying to be more inclusive and you, and for whatever reasons, whether noble or whether um, financial or what have you, I do think that there is more, not just to include different members from the community, but also different things like comedy and uh, action movies and stuff like that because they do seem to uh, be struggling, I guess, with relevance. Well, that sort of leads into... The question I wanted to ask you in relation to sort of independent versus mainstream commercial productions in comics. I mean, in Chapter 5, like you mentioned, one of the images you start with is Marvel's Divas, mm -hmm. multicultural group of women who have superpowers of various kinds. Some people, I guess, really liked it. Some people really didn't like it. But the interesting thing I thought was a quote that you mentioned of one of the, I think it was the uh, illustrator or maybe the writer. Mm -hmm. So the women... Basically, on the cover of the comic, they look like it could be almost a Playboy cover, hypersexualized, exaggerated features, all of these things. But then inside, there's actually a lot more to it. There's a lot more substance. But then the person that... From Marvel. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They say that it's... Um... Quiet covers don't sell. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. it's basically a uh, a money issue, which I found interesting. Whether or not you buy that as a justification, it reminded me of an interview I did with Nancy Ewan about people of color and how a lot of Hollywood casting directors and other people who are in charge of basically who gets to be seen and represented will say, you know, I wish I could hire a woman or I wish I could hire a person of color, but they don't sell as well or it wouldn't sell as well. And so there's always this commercial issue which is interesting because the cover things seem to be the same, right? Like, I wish I could talk about female superheroes as, you know, empowered women, but I really have to show them as super sexy too, or else nobody's going to buy the comic. But how do you negotiate these kinds of claims, especially when it comes to representations of, of either visible minorities or marginalized groups that frequently don't get the representation that they want and arguably that they should be getting, because at least that's what people say uh, is that it's a financial issue? I think it is a financial issue, even though things are, are changing and opening up. You know, I mean, now we're at a moment where Afu Richardson is illustrating popular mainstream characters. And one of the really important things that I got out of uh, my conversations with her was about some of her earlier work, even in the independent realm, and the ways in which she would draw the physiognomy and some people thinking, well, it's not any different than people who are, you know, illustrators who are representing women in these sort of hypersexualized ways. Your, your illustrations are very similar. And her point was there is nothing wrong about illustrating or having representations of women as sexual, as scantily clad, as whatever, that that's that's part of the art. So that modesty and censorship, you know, are perhaps just some things that, you know, some writers and artists don't want to be beholden to. And, and, and I think, you know, she made a really good point and was really meaningful for me. And so in my uh, sort of conclusion or epigraph, when I'm talking about Marvel divas, the point I tried to make, and maybe perhaps this, you know, comes out of my own sort of um, politics around, you know, feminism and, you know, I identifying as this feminist cultural critic artist, uh, you know, also trying to let's move beyond the conversation of sexual and hypersexual or what the cover looks like. Uh, we can critique the cover. Sure. Fine. Let's do that. And then after that, let's look deeper at more. <laughs> and so we're not just sort of replaying these old conversations about the representation of women and, and sexuality and keeping it in this sort of really binary place. Well, there's two issues there, right? I guess there's the, the hypersexualization, which can be used to sell covers, for example, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the lack thereof uh, would arguably sell less and so people are not as interested. But also, what about when not talking about uh, sexuality, but just people of color 
being turned down for roles or, or a superhero being another white man because that's been arguably, and again, in, in scare quotes, proven to sell, whereas uh, it would be too risky, say, to make the character black or to make the character a woman or a black woman. How do you negotiate these kinds of claims? Well, those claims were not unfounded. So absolutely, if you look at history over time, there is not necessarily a great record of uh, people who um, are of the dominant culture necessarily being interested in the representation of different races or ethnicities that they don't identify with unless they were represented in uh, stereotypical ways, although you cannot say that across the board, right? Mm-hmm. So this is not to say that, oh, everyone um, who who identifies as being a member of the dominant culture only wants to see people of color in stereotyped ways. That's just not true. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, these major companies are, they want to profit. They want to sell their work. And so they stay with a formula that works. And that formula worked for a long time. So if we have a black character, let's make him Luke Cage, right? Or, you know, let's have Nubia and have her be very sort of stereotypical and scantily clad, although she was not just that. She was a lot of other important things, too. Uh, you know, I'm talking about Nubia from the, the comic book Wonder Woman. That's not unfounded, but I think with, uh, I know, with the film Black Panther, with the explosion on television, both DC and Marvel, you know, there's just so many titles now. The Flash, you know, has a very, I'm talking about the television shows right now, mm-hmm. has a very multicultural cast, Gotham, and they're huge hits on television. Now that argument of, oh, we'd like to do this differently, but we don't know if it's going to sell or we don't know if people are interested. We know now that people are interested. Well, and that's the interesting thing, I I suppose, about Wonder Woman in terms of having a female lead. Black Panther, of course, in having a more diverse cast. And and Luke Cage is doing quite well, I guess. Doing very well. I haven't seen the ratings in the last one. But is there there a problem with saying like, okay, well, now that we can make money or now that there's a possibility of making money, now we can show more diverse people? Is that problematic, I guess, do you think? Well, I think it can be problematic. And one of the things, and you know, I teach this course on the black image and sequential art. And it was a great time to teach a course like this because there's so much material. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we talked about is, yeah, so now we have Black Lightning. We have Luke Cage. We have black characters and, and, and all of these other titles. Is it too much? Are we now at a moment where, okay, we're going to throw in some people of color that could be black or some other ethnicity or ambiguous so we can just like hit all of the demographics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, perhaps it is a little bit of, of, of pandering. Yeah, I think that's a valid critique. But uh, well, whatever it is, I, you know, I, I think it's a good idea. One could ask if we're at a moment right now where, where you are just inundated with so many characters, it might seem like, well, wow, does difference really matter? Does it really matter to have Black Lightning <laughs> in, you know, 2018? Or is it just, is he now just another string of a lot of other characters of color? I think, I think it does matter. Well, yeah, and I think it, we are definitely at an interesting time where there's a lot more possibilities of going to, uh, well, going to a theater, but also especially streaming and getting a lot more options with a lot more diverse um opportunities for people, although definitely not necessarily where where it should be or where it could be. What do you want to do next in terms of your scholarship? Are you working on a new project? Do you have any plans, I guess, to further the work that you've done in uh, Black Women in Sequence? Or are you moving on to a different realm? What's uh, what's in the future for you? You know, I have several projects, some articles, um, a couple book projects that are not about sequential art uh, at all. Although in this one book I'm working on, I will have a chapter on 3D animation and gaming and virtual worlds. But in terms of comic, I've recently finished an article on the character Friday Foster, the comic book, or the comic strip. Well, it was a comic book, and it was also a comic strip. That was in uh, the, the Chicago Tribune, and then Dell did a comic book. And then, of course, Friday Foster became a film with, well, how am I blanking on her name? Pam Greer. There we go. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, that sounds familiar. Yeah, in the 1970s, there was a sort of, I mean, people would characterize it as a black exploitation ish um, film, you know, called Friday Foster. 
and the character was portrayed um, by Pamela Greer. But it started as a comic strip um, that was not right, written by someone who's um, black or person person of African descent at all, but you know was was written by a a white author who said um, there isn't a lot of representation of blackness in comics. So he wanted to take on the challenge of trying to come up with a comic strip that would do better. And there's this really great piece in The New Yorker, published in the early 1970s, about this and how the original creator of Friday Foster, um, why he created the character, how he chose the the illustrator and, and all of the things he was thinking about and all the stakes involved in him doing this comic strip in the early 1970s and wanting to get things right. And so I just finished a piece about Friday Foster. She appears on the cover of my book, but I don't talk about her in the book. Hmm. And some people have asked me about that. There came a time where I needed to finish. (laughs) And so I originally, I wanted to have to have a chapter on Friday Foster and I wanted to have a chapter on Martha Washington, Mm -hmm. but it was, it would have been a bigger book. And so I just ended up not doing it. So for the Friday Foster piece, I just finished. I am doing a keywords in comic studies book, uh, you know, sort of an anthology of keywords and vocabulary with um, Ramsey Fawes and, and Shelley Street. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I remember seeing that or yeah. hearing about that because I, yeah, I spoke to him in the last season. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, so we're right in the midst of um, doing that. But uh, That's cool. yeah, but the monograph I'm working on right now is on representations of disassociative identities in popular culture, film, television, popular memoirs, and novels. And then I'm also talking about virtual worlds and gaming. I actually I could talk about comics if I wanted to. Because so many superheroes have these sort of live these double lives, right? They have, you know, like Superman, yeah, yeah. Batman, what have you. There's the, the character during the day and then there's the superhero character. And so there would definitely be room to talk about comics in this monograph. But I do want to, I, I'm still interested in comics. I'm still writing about comics, but also wanting to do other things as well. But that still allows me to talk about all of the things I'm invested in, you know, bringing People, figures uh, who oftentimes are not talked about at all, or when they are, they're not seen as fundamental to the historical narrative, to the political narrative, to economics, what have you. I mean, that's also, I mean, that's always a sort of like the broader thing that I want to do. And again, Mm -hmm. thinking about issues of social justice as well. So I just think there's so many avenues to get at and to talk about those things and why they matter. So those are some of the things I've finished and some of the things that are coming up. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, I think Black Women in Sequence definitely adds to that conversation. And I really look forward to seeing what you're doing uh, in the future that will continue to add to and create a sort of nuanced conversation about a number of these things that fit in and out of different representational realms like comics and video games and television and movies. Yeah, I'm so glad we got a chance to speak, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's just been a pleasure discussing these ideas and these characters with you. Thank you. And thank you for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. Check out our website at tinapp.org or visit us on any of the social media you're using. And please, if you get a chance, leave a review. I'm really honored to be able to speak with some really brilliant people in the weeks and months ahead, and I hope you'll tune in for that.